Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the Moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray, and today I'm joined by my co-hosts Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. And today we will all be interviewing the incredible Adam Fixer. Uh, and Adam, before I ask you how you're doing, uh, I'll introduce you to our audience in case people don't know who you are. Uh, so Adam is the co-founder and CTO, I believe, or at least were the CTO. I don't. I, I, I presume you still are of Wasabi Wallet. Uh, co-founder of ZK Snacks Limited and privacy uh, in Bitcoin advocate. Um, so how are you doing today, Adam? Hey guys, I'm doing doing great. A uh, bit afraid of the cockroaches around me, but yeah, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> that's all right. I say it's uh, what well, doesn't clean makes you stronger. So there you go. That's the that's the spirit to have. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you want to give yourself an introduction or if you're happy with my kind of jumbled summary. Um, but please go ahead if you want to introduce yourself to, to the audience a bit better. So your summary is perfect. You just, uh, I just wanted to say that I'm not the CTO anymore. But uh, yeah, I started Wasabi. So Wasabi is a privacy-oriented Bitcoin wallet for those who don't know. Uh, I, I guess that you have to know that. <laughs> Gotcha. No, thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I thought it might might have changed, but I wasn't entirely certain. So I thought I'd just uh, run with it anyway. Um, but yeah, I, um, well, yeah, I mean, essentially what we wanted to do is just go straight into um, asking you some questions, really, and, and like kind of dig into, you know, uh, learn a bit more about you and Wasabi Wallet and what you've done and what you're doing. Um, so I'll kick it off with a with a question, um, I suppose. So yeah, I was obviously like looking at a few of like the past few interviews you've done and just trying to sort of get a better feeling for who you are as a person. Um, and uh, one of the things I guess I wanted to ask was that like you were a .NET developer um, and that around that when you discovered Bitcoin, that's kind of what you were doing. Um, what was it that actually led you on the path to creating a wallet like and, and i guess what was it that made you think when you discovered um bitcoin okay this is something i want to actually work with because obviously it could have been that you just say that i'm a dev but also i like bitcoin what was it that actually made you make that kind of jump into actually getting involved in the bitcoin world professionally i just saw a low-hanging fruit to to do something that people needed and i wanted to write a software finally that many people are using not only in a in a control room six people you previously like you know the open source uh, the closed source world like you mentioned .NET there sorry let's let just go back uh, a bit because you mentioned .NET there I, I guess that's that's what you're curious about .NET is a programming language or, or a flame framework C sharp is the programming language .NET is the framework and it's created by Microsoft. And you might have heard that Microsoft was not the most, most ethical company in the world previously. Um, and, and so .NET was a closed sourced, uh, closed sourced Windows only programming language, basically. And and so I was writing closed source software and the closed source software is usually very few people are using it. I mean, in the business to business scenario. So, so I, I wanted to write something that many people are using and give me feedback that how is that software is because I had, I had no feedback basically at all regarding the code that I, I wrote. So, so I still, a uh, Reddit or Bitcoin post that Join Market, which is a coin join implementation, just just came out, and I thought it would be it. It was a command line software, and I thought it would be great to write a user interface for it. So that's how I started Wasabi Wallet. Many things happened later. I never. I never released the join market user interface. So, so many things happened later, but that was the basic idea. Just write the user interface for join market. So many people use my software. Um, yeah, and I guess it succeeded. <laughs> no, I gotcha. Okay. So it was kind of like, um, so it's one of those situations where you're thinking, I want to write some open source software, try something slightly different anyway. Um, and then you kind of sin 
something that's interesting uh, to you uh, in pay join and, uh, and, and coin join. And, and, um, and so you've kind of sat there and gone, okay, well, let's give this a shot. People seem to want like a potentially a user interface for this, or I think people will want user interface for this. And then it kind of developed from, Hey, this is what the people want. This is what I'll do kind of thing, I guess. Right. I could, was it, was it kind of like, um, I guess it, was it like a demand from the people or what the users wanted that made you then create Wasabi wallet, or was it more something that you kind of wanted to do that people just happened to want? When join market came out, you, you know, I, I was astonished by the fact that so many people were so excited about it and it's just a command line software, right? Like it didn't really work properly on Windows. So it's like, how, how can this happen? Anyway, if I, if I write this software, the demand was clear there. And, and then as I, as I dived into the Bitcoin privacy scheme much more, I realized that basically there is centralized mixers and join market, and that was it. And the problem with centralized mixers, uh, let's call them traditional mixers instead. The problem with traditional mixers is that they can steal your money and de-anonymize you. So that's, that's not very good. And, and so it was, it's just kind of obvious that if you write a software that cannot steal your money and cannot de anonymize you and easy to use, then many people are gonna use it. Um, yeah, that that was that was my thinking. At what point did you start working on like the hidden wallet project, which eventually became Wasabi? Like you were working on join market first and then you decided to start your own or was hidden wallet like already kind of a thing it, it, actually in 2015 december when i decided to work on the join market stuff i already called when i you know i i wrote my my plans in a paper and i already called that that wallet hidden hidden wallet so and the idea was that it implements always the most up to date, the, the most robust Bitcoin privacy technology. I didn't want to do the research by myself, although I ended up doing it <laughs> later. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, the idea was was there at that point. And and after that, I I changed to Tumblebit, which is which is a coin swap improvement before the recent coin swap improvements. Uh, might be a bit confusing anyway. And, and later on, I realized that you can do it much easier what I was doing with coin joins. And that's how the zero link research framework came around. And then we built Wasabi. And then the last one, maybe one and a half a year, we were actually working on an update to Wasabi, which, well, which will be Wasabi Wallet 2.0. And, 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 and I really hope this will provide a user experience that a normal Bitcoin wallet would provide without privacy. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful because if we cannot make Bitcoin private with Wasabi Wallet 2.0 by default, then, then uh, I'm not sure anything else will. Uh, I was just going to ask, what what should we be looking forward to seeing in Wasabi 2.0? Uh, hopefully, removing the friction. Um, for example, I, I think that the largest implications, the the transaction structure have the largest implications. Right? We explain the the simplest explanation of coin join is that many people come together, create a shared transaction and broadcast that to the network, right? This is the simplest explanation. But if you would go into the details of Wasabi or join market, or let's go into the details of Wasabi, then, then we have to start explaining that, uh, okay, but the output amounts of every user must be equal. So it has to come out in, equally and, and then it, it gets much more complicated to explain. Now, Wasabi 2.0 or, or the research that we call Wasabi is going to make that simplest explanation correct. 
So that's great because many people come together, many different input amounts, and then build a transaction where, where basically we succeeded to find a way to, to create equal outputs, but in the most block space efficient way without creating any changes or maybe very few changes. Of course, if someone comes with 1000 Bitcoin, then he's gonna have, have a big change because that's a lot of money and no one has uh, comes even close. So, so yeah, it's, I, I think we will be able to gain some privacy after only one coin join for all the money that you have, because right now you have to do like many, many rounds to, to anonymize your, your, your wallet. So I, so this is probably the most block space efficient way of doing coin joins and privacy in Bitcoin. So do you think um, some of the things that have prevented people from using Wasabi in the past are going to kind of be resolved in 2.0? And this is kind of um, going to bring Wasabi Wallet to more and more and more users. I, I guess it, it sounds like you've kind of uh, realized what you think has been a, a drawback or a barrier to like a lot of users. Um, I guess it's 2.0 going to be more beginner friendly as well. Um, Oh, that's that's hundred percent true. If you just think about the current wasabi, you have to have zero point one bitcoin to even do the coin join. That's a security parameter, but you have to have that much for wasabi two point oh. You you don't need any 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 minimum one amount. So, so that will enable a lot more people to to gain privacy bitcoin surely. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Well, that, that makes uh, that's quite interesting. To yeah, I didn't realize about the minimum amount changed coming in two point so That's cool. Um, I've like experimented with Wasabi Wallet in in the past, uh, but not uh, in the last couple of months. Um, when it comes to uh, Wasabi Wallet, and, and I suppose a lot of the work you've done in the Bitcoin world, uh, a lot of it is privacy focused. Um, would you say that's kind of something that you? personally care about a lot is that like a you know something that in in your personal life you know you're, you're very much someone who's pro privacy or, or, or do you or is it more something that just you found yourself finding something that you thought was cool people wanted it hey i'm just gonna develop it and then it kind of just kind of makes sense as like a usp as like a unique selling point for uh, wasabi wallet so you're just continuing with the privacy focus is it more something that's personal to you or is it more of a hey this makes sense for our wallet to stand apart and be the best at this many people start working on privacy because because of some personal experience or or or, or but but i did not have anything right like i i came into the space as a blank blank sheet i didn't know anything about privacy and and so i had to go into and and look at look at all the things that's what 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 is even privacy and and you know it's it's so much deeper than i thought like this is such a huge rabbit hole that if you if you if you really go far enough then you're going to even realize that your personal development is based on your privacy, your ability to selectively reveal yourself to the world, which is the definition of privacy. And every child starts out with zero privacy and then they have to figure out where their boundaries are, both, both their physical boundaries and their mental boundaries. And that's basically self-development. They figure out where which are the boundaries of their self and that's maturation so so privacy goes really really deep in in the psychological level and and also on the economic and and, and other 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 areas and, and yeah I, I did not have any any biases or preconceived notions when I came into to working on, on Bitcoin privacy, I, I had to start everything from zero. Just you sort of built it from scratch. I suppose on the on the privacy side of things, yeah, as you say, privacy is like a well, it's one word for a lot, <laughs> basically. Like, you know, there's so much to privacy in general. Um, but I suppose um when it comes to Bitcoin, um it's obviously pseudonymous, but it hasn't really got like 
a lot of privacy folk like tons of privacy focused features baked into it really and its design unlike something like monero for example which it's sort of core aim is to be privacy focused um so i suppose with things like this recent tap root uh, upgrade which is likely going to come soon um do you i mean what what's your thoughts on tap root like do you think that enough is being done personally by by bitcoin core and uh, to actually upgrade the the privacy of, of bitcoin tap root is is nice but doesn't solve that many things it solves some very specific things uh for example it makes it, it removes uh, removes an attack vector from a privacy attack vector, not security. Actually, privacy is security. Anyway, it removes an attack vector on on the Lightning Network. So, so that's nice. That's about Taproot. Schnorr signature aggregation makes coin chains a little bit cheaper. So, yeah, I guess if you want to say that I'm not very excited about the current improvements and now do I want core to improve Bitcoin's privacy more and I'm, I'm afraid there is only one thing that I can I can right now say that could 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 add some some really substantial improvement to Bitcoin privacy which is about confidential transactions uh confidential transactions you know a transaction bitcoin transaction comes with inputs and outputs and the outputs have a script and an amount every output has a script and an amount and confidential transactions basically make that amount masks that amount that makes it unknown to those who don't participate in the transaction as it should be and and on that, we can build even more block space efficient coin joins, but, but that's a huge change. And, and you know, I, I was talking about Adam Gibson, talking with Adam Gibson, and, and he said that confidential transactions is a change in Bitcoin that that has a chicken and an egg problem. Like no one tries it, therefore no one is, no one is working on it. <laughs> therefore, everyone thinks it's not gonna get into Bitcoin. But uh, I suppose if someone starts to work on it, then it has a chance to get into Bitcoin and 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 change stuff from the bottom up. But I also think Wasabi can can get to that point where where privacy is can be used by default and even the coin swaps coin swaps can can achieve privacy that probably cannot be even achieved on any other altcoin so coin swaps is that good but it's it's more expensive than coin joins so so I'm not not sure also also just think about the numbers that we are talking here the uh, what is the, what is the anonymity set of of yours? Because that's what measures your privacy. If if you think about it, is that how many people could have done the same action that you have done previously? That's an anonymity set. And if you think about cash, we are transacting in cash. Our anonymity set is like, um, let's say Hungarians. It's ten million people. Like you really don't know. Uh, that, that's how huge the anonymity set for the for, for the US, I don't know, 500 million people. But for, and even for Xiaomi and eCash, uh, it, it could be really huge as many people are using that, that system. But for cryptocurrencies, um, like Wasabi has 50, 100, um, Samurai is five, Joint Market has uh, two to eight uh, variable, and and Monero, I think twelve is now their 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 what is called mixing number. So 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 we are not talking about such huge numbers, and and you know like. Cryptocurrencies have some really 
huge limitations. If you if you think about it, what what do we want to to actually build? We want to build as good money as we can. So, what is the best money that we can possibly conceptualize? Um, there are many theories, but Aristotle and, and people are somewhat somewhat in agreement in that money has to fulfill some specific purposes, which is divisibility, portability. Uh, fungibility, auto acceptability, uh, unit of value, and, and, and a couple of these. And if you think about with cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin brought in the scarcity. Now no one can print more money out of thin air, which is <laughs> which is such an obvious thing, but like that's the huge innovation of Bitcoin. And there are three more areas where Bitcoin is sorry, four more areas where Bitcoin is not very good. One is fungibility, portability, acceptability, and stability. But, you know, stability and acceptability doesn't really matter because as the market capitalization, any currency grows, then, then they're gonna get take care of, taken care of themselves. So we, we are left with portability and fungibility as the two most important thing to work on. And, you know, portability is about how fast and how cheap you can transfer value to another person. Um, and Bitcoin and all the blockchain-based currencies suck a lot in this area. Like, like seriously, you have to wait 20 minutes and pay probably let's assume everyone in the world is using Bitcoin and you would have to pay um, $10,000 for a transaction for fees, something like that, like huge, huge unspeakable amounts. Uh, so the point is there that portability seems to be a larger issue right now. Now let's see if Lightning Network fixes it, but even that doesn't seem to, to be, that doesn't seem to scale Bitcoin enough so all the people in the world will be able to use it properly. So, so, so we, can, we can scale with banks. Anyway, the, the, the point is that there are a lot of things to work on and fungibility of Bitcoin is, hmm, let's see, it's not terrible, right? Because compare them to the NFTs of today, like the non-fungible tokens. Uh, Bitcoin is nothing as non-fungible as the NFTs, but it's also not as good as a uh, cash or chummy and e-cash. So, so we have to make improvements there, but there is also the portability aspect, which is like, <laughs> you, you gain something on portability, you lose on fungibility, or with confidential transactions, people are saying that if we would introduce confidential transactions, then we would not have to, we, we wouldn't be able to be sure about the supply anymore. So we would sacrifice scarcity for, for that. I believe that's a good compromise. Uh, I think most of the people disagree with me on that. I think people would rather make sure in a mathematical certainty, not only the cryptographic certainty that confidential transaction provides. People would rather be mathematically sure that it's not gonna be inflated, right? Um, I, would, I would be okay with, with being cryptographically certain about that. So, so, so yeah, uh, th there is the disagreement and, yeah, I, I would like if if we would get confidential transaction in Bitcoin, certainly I think that's more important than than the theoretical scarcity risk. Gotcha. I guess because you mentioned uh, the issues with fungibility um, and with portability, and I suppose what Wasabi what it is doing is kind of helping with fungibility anyway. Um, because obviously if you can essentially make sure that um, all of the transactions people make 
if, if you can make sure that people aren't going to sort of separate out Bitcoin that's like non KYC or KYC or from certain addresses, then you're kind of helping with the fungibility aspect. So if everyone's using Wasabi Wallet and they're all um, having their transactions masked, then that's good for fungibility, I, I would I would expect. Um, and I suppose on the portability side, uh, you've got things like, the, as you said, the Lightning Network that are working on that, albeit uh, there's probably more that needs to be done there. Um, but it is still relatively new or in its infancy if you compare it to, or even Bitcoin is in its infancy if you compare it to other currencies. I mean, um, and, and Bitcoin doesn't have, you know, multiple governments with a lot of uh, finances behind it, backing it either. It's, it's kind of people power driven. Um, but I suppose the question I wanted to ask you, based on what you said, um, was with the Lightning Network, which you mentioned, um, I guess from my perspective um, and what I understand of, of the Lightning Network, it does help a little with privacy uh, as well as uh, helping scalability, especially if you are running your own node. Um, but it doesn't really go the whole way um, in helping users be anonymous or anything like that um, instead of pseudonymous. Um, so I suppose I wanted to know like what your view of the Lightning Network was, like how much of a fan you are or are not of it in its, in its like achievement of helping with Bitcoin scalability and I guess in a sense with privacy as well in, in Bitcoin and anonymity. The Lightning Network is the only credible idea that can scale Bitcoin without compromising on like the non-custodial aspect of of you you keeping your own money so so i believe the lightning network is a very important technology now regarding privacy i i, I used to not look into it and i just listened to people i thought they know what they are talking about and they said that they said that the lightning network is is like a dark network no one knows what's going on there but Lately, multiple research papers came out that that's very, very far from the case. So the Lightning Network privacy as of today doesn't look very well, but it's not really because it can't be, because no one can do anything about it. It's just because no one started to work on Lightning Network privacy yet. Like there is no one who is working on Lightning Network privacy. And, we, of course, we want to work on it, but there are so many other things to do just yet on chain. Um, of course, Wasabi will have Lightning Network because that seems to be the only way to scale Bitcoin. But, uh, but we will have to make sure that its privacy is, that it is providing privacy and, and not just gonna end up later as a disaster as, as, as frankly Bitcoin to a degree did at, at this point. It, it, and it is a disaster. I mean, yeah, if you think about the chain analysis companies, just they shouldn't even exist, um, but they do, right? And that's a uh, design flaw. So, so anyhow, there is a lot more work to do on the Lightning Network, and I I think we can we can we can make it private. But I I don't really know because I didn't go into the protocol level and started tinkering about it at, at this point yet. What was your opinion on that Europol report that came out about a year ago, where they named Wasabi Wallet as like stopping uh, investigations and stuff? Mm, so one year ago, a Europol report came out that. Um, they talked a lot about Wasabi and actually as I was reading, it, it was a long time ago, right? But as I remember, it was surprisingly correct on the technical level. So I was happy about that they were not able to do anything with Wasabi transactions. But on the other hand, it's it's fairly worrisome, right? Like, it's just not a good thing to see on your product on a Europol report. <laughs> it doesn't give you a lot of, uh, but, but anyhow, I mean, uh, 
I, I think it's okay because if you think about the alternative is that no one is like building privacy on Bitcoin is it can't be criminalized, right? Because then Bitcoin becomes completely unusable if these heuristics start to stand. <laughs> like that's just, that would be just just silly, and I, I think it's okay. Uh, but yeah, so technically that that report seemed to seem to stand stand its stand its ground even even against the lead developer of Wasabi. <laughs> I was thinking this, like, obviously we're talking about um, kind of essential or crucial upgrades to Bitcoin as core and to Lightning and, and things like that. Um, but obviously, large institutions and governments probably don't want to see <laughs> this priv these privacy-based upgrades. It's kind of like, you know, from, from our perspective and, and, I, and I guess from yours as well, you know, we're very much pro, I mean, I, I very much am pro having privacy and anonymity where possible and... Uh, all these upgrades being made to Bitcoin. Um, but I can assume that, yeah, large financial institutions and governments won't be because essentially for the large financial institutions, they want to make sure they're abiding by, you know, AML and KYC laws and they don't want to get in trouble with the government and they don't want to touch money that has somehow been involved in you know, money laundering or terrorism funding or theft. Um, and for the governments, they want to have control um, at the end of the day over their people to a degree. And they also want to make sure that they aren't, you know, uh, making it easier for crime to, to go ahead. So I suppose there's this kind of on, ongoing, I, I can foresee there being a battle between, um, you know, the general populace and, 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 and Bitcoin fans and then the government and large institutions who kind of will want actually less and less privacy probably and more openness um and more kycing at, at the point of exchange from fiat to bitcoin so i don't fully see it that way because governments aren't really like it's convenient to think about governments as something as, as a personalized thing that has one wheel but that's that's not the case it's in, in fact just going back to to your know your customer example like is know your customer doing know your customer really the really what the, the exchange wants to do. I mean, the exchange wants to provide privacy for their users and not ruin their privacy. So, so, so that, that doesn't stand in their interest. And similarly to governments, I mean, it, you can only, only ruin the privacy of your own citizens. And you might make that, that decision there, but but probably that's not what you will want to have because then your citizens won't have privacy and, and the citizens in China will. Uh, or, or if you think about from an economic perspective or, or, or on a historic perspective, is that the, the, the war on encryption has been won by the cypherpunks, right? Like encryption is everywhere. The U.S. government doesn't have a export control on encryption anymore, or maybe it does, but no one cares. Who cares? The point is that the cyberpunks won because politicians have insecure property rights and making. So, so for example, there was a case called Clipper Chip. Um, I just read about it yesterday. Uh, have, have you guys heard about the Clipper chip uh, proposal? It, it, it was about everyone has a Clipper chip in, in the 1990s, and that will be their encryption key there. And the special feature of that Clipper chip is that it's not only you can access that, but also the US government uh, have access to your private key. So. So, so, so that's the big idea, and and they were really pushing it when encryption came out, and and I think it still did not, they still did not give up on it. But who cares? Like no one knows about it anymore. At that time, it wanted to be the big thing, the big. This is how we are going to use encryption with this clipper chip. Uh, it didn't work out that way because politicians have insecure property rights, which means that. I think Bill Clinton was at the time in, in, in the White House in the US. And, you know, 
he was not incentivized to, to actually try to push this clipper chip incident, clipper chip on the people because that would be very unpopular, even if 14, 20 years from there on, it would be much better for the US government if they can, um, if they can get access to every single person's <laughs> encryption, <laughs> private key. Uh, but, but he wasn't incentivized. He, he, he didn't want to take that risk. He, he was incentivized to have short-term decisions and that means they are not pushing the creeper chips. So, so, so I think even in the incentives on the governmental level are, I do not perfectly <laughs> great for privacy, but most of the people understand why they have to close the door when they go to toilet, right? Like they understand the value of privacy inherently, you just have to like, like make it explicit. <laughs> yeah, um, so Adam, uh, what do you think would be the biggest um, um, limitations or barrier to uh, adoption of some privacy tools? Could it be, you know, people's reckless, you know, careless attitude towards privacy or the lack of, you know, um, user-friendly options. Like I remember, you did mention that um, with the Wasabi uh, with uh, 2.0, that you intend to remove all the you know possible frictions that will enable users, you know, have a seamless experience, you know, while using, you know, um, Wasabi. So, what do do you think is, is the lack of awareness of what you know privacy privacy tools could mean for them, or the lack of privacy could actually you know mean for people? What do you think would be the biggest limitations for people adopting a private tools? Mm, I, I think I have a very specific answer for it. And maybe, maybe let's go back in time a little bit and think about Xiaomi and eCash. Because, you know, when, when the cyberpunks figured out how to do an anonymous currency, not a decentralized one like Bitcoin, but in the 90s, an anonymous currency, uh, then people think that Xiaomi and eCash did not get used because, because government shut them down. But that's very far from the case. Actually, that might be the case. Who knows? But the point is that that's what people think. And if you look at the research, it... <laughs> Even today, you, you wouldn't have a proper Chomian, a proper anonymous eCash just yet that could be used properly. So I think the technology, the, the user experience, that's the bottleneck here. People are not going to use a software that they have to set up a Linux for and type things in the command line, right? And that's what most privacy software user experience is like. So I, I believe you just have to make a software as easy as any other software, except with privacy, and then you will have adoption. Gotcha, so it's like, um, yeah, I suppose it's like if you look at some of the, super privacy focused like uh linux distros and and even like the linux uh i think it's like the true phone i can't remember it's called now it's like the mobile phone that's based uh, there's no real incentive for a lot of people to use them even if they are super privacy plus because uh, well it's more expensive but, but you're paying more for a product that just doesn't work as well or isn't as usable as like an iphone basically so the challenge is to make something as good as an iphone or an android device but and, and at the same cost or less but that is privacy pro and privacy focused, I suppose, which is quite a tough challenge to do. But I did ask that question because um, I remember when, you know, lots of people came around saying, you know, do not use WhatsApp, you know, your privacy is, comp your privacy is compromised and, you know, um, they're gonna spy on you. I remember the rumor, you know, that fear mongering happening back then in Nigeria during the whole COVID-19 scare and the vaccine scare. And people like, don't take the vaccine and like, oh, they can spy on you, WhatsApp. And, you know, due to that, you know, mania, people went and started downloading uh, Signal app, but um, despite the fact that Signal is, you know, I think to an extent, bit friendly, there was no um, 
the, the usage wasn't quite there. People weren't using it. They were then downloading and setting up, setting up the profiles, but they were not actually using the app. So it now led me to think, is, could it be the same problem on Bitcoin where people are not just, you know, just, there might be an outrage, it could be full, you know, full outrage, you know, it's all, you know, um, how do I put it, just for, all for cloud, but there is no real um, urgency for them to use, you know, privacy tools. Maybe they are not really aware of the dangers um, of not, you know, trying to, you know, make their transactions, you know, private. They feel, you know, they are, you know, they are also willing you know, to KYC on exchanges, you know, they do not see a problem with, you know, shielding themselves, you know, even online, you just share whatever they like, you know, they feel like sharing online when they should, you know, be a bit more careful and try to up their, you know, upset. So um, I tend to agree with what, you know, Adam has said, you know, regards to the fact that, you know, it has to do with, you know, um, the user experience, you know, when they have to, you know, feel they have to do too much, you know, when we are, we are in an age where, you know, everything is, Simple with a few click, you know, clicks of you know a button on your app. But right now they have, they feel like they have to do too much. But I also feel that it has to do with an attitude towards privacy in general. So would that be a fair summary of what you're saying? That I think Edward Snowden said it that privacy doesn't matter until it does. That's that's your point, right? And um, yeah, and I I I agree. I, I agree. I. I think that's that's true. Uh, <clears throat> let me see what what can I say about the. Uh, how about uh, have you heard about the privacy paradox? It's a the privacy paradox is a well known phenomenon. It's many research paper has been written about it. It's about people say they care about their privacy, yet they act like they don't. And that's the privacy paradox. Like they, people are observed that they don't care about their privacy. They click agree, 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 agree. Uh, but when you ask them, they're gonna say that, oh no, I, 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 I value my privacy very highly and, 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 and so keep that in mind. But that's not what's happening. So what, what is happening? Uh, there was a meta-analysis lately that you know, the highest level of evidence is that people, that this all comes down to poor risk management, sorry, poor cost benefit analysis and risk assessment. So, so what does that mean? It means that People say they care about their privacy, that they're not gonna use privacy tools anyway. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's a problem. I, I, I guess you're completely right about that. In fact, that's my argument against privacy coins, not, not against privacy coins. I don't have anything against privacy coins. It's just why I want to work on Bitcoin's privacy and not an altcoin, a privacy altcoin. Uh, I want to work on Bitcoin's privacy because I think people don't care about their privacy that much. So Bitcoin is going to be the largest currency of the world because privacy, fungibility is the only thing that Bitcoin doesn't have and people don't seem to care about that. So let's make Bitcoin private instead of, instead of working on a privacy coin because it doesn't seem to gain adoption just based on the merits of its privacy. Um, so, so your, I, I guess the strategy is, our strategy is that let's make our software as good as any other Bitcoin wallet software, but our software will have privacy in it. And will that be enough to, to get, the people use it, um, I, I hope so. I hope if people have a choice between no privacy and privacy, then they're gonna use the privacy. I wanted to ask you, can you kind of break down what, why there's a rivalry between Wasabi and Samurai Wallet? Like, I, isn't it kind of counterproductive? Like, shouldn't you guys be kind of working together rather than um, 
having disagreements? Mm, no, I, I, I believe samurai wallet is, is, is a scam and the people who are running it are fraudsters. So, so, so no, I, I don't like to associate myself with fraudsters. Gotcha. I suppose what you're saying before about um, about people hopefully using uh, Wasabi Wallet because obviously they will see that it's this, it's a, as good experience, if not better, than other um, wallets, but with the added privacy built in to it. Um, I suppose that kind of comes to the, like the first problem or the first thing with privacy is like, hey, it's all well and good making you know. Uh, session and signal and all these applications for encrypted communication and it's all well and good having Tor browser and it's all well and good having a Wasabi wallet and it's all well and good using Bitcoin on Wasabi wallet or using Monero if you want to go and do that but at the end of the day if you do the, the, the first problem and the first thing to solve is actually education or people doing what they're doing so you could go on Tor browser for example and then you can full screen it and open up a giant YouTube video and you've probably screwed yourself already with how actually useful tour is to you and you can go and you know use wasabi wallet but then you can go and say to people hey i just sent 50 bucks to my buddy and we're like doing money laundering or something you know what i mean like you, people were pretty stupid in this day, in this day and age you know myself included um so when it comes to privacy i suppose the first problem is probably people like people need to really learn what they're doing online and relearn what they share and, and relearn how they do things and educate themselves and be educated and then i suppose the next step is then okay well these tools are here now i know how to use them properly um so i guess what i'm trying to get at, i suppose is like the, the, the first problem is human beings like we we need to be trained to be private before we can then go and you know use privacy focused software i just want to add something that it might not be true, but my observation is that older, the more older someone, the less likely is going to join to the new social media platform, right? It's not my observation, that's, that's an obvious fact. And I think what, <clears throat> what's happening here is that the more or older you are, the more you know your boundaries, the more you want to enforce that boundaries to the outside world. And one of the boundaries is that you don't enter into a new agreement with a new social media application. Uh, you're not trading your privacy against someone else. Uh, you're not trading your privacy uh, for a, another service because let's say Facebook is good enough for you, you don't, you don't need Instagram to, you, you might do, but you wouldn't trade your privacy for instance. That's the same company, isn't it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> they, did, they didn't used to be though, right? When they came out. So the point you're making is still there. <laughs> yeah. So, so the older you are, the more, the, the less education you need, because the more conscious decisions you're going to, to make. So, what to do with 16 years old people who just want to explore all kinds of stuff on the internet. Uh, you see, they don't have time. They, they, are very, they are very keen on learning all kinds of new things because they're gonna just be left behind, right? Like that's your most, when you're 16, when you're, the younger you are, the more you learn. So you can't just mess around reading privacy policies all day, right? Like uh, that's that's not working out. Where to? That's a hard question. Um, what what to do with people? You can't really educate them, right? That's you have to you have to build the software that doesn't need to be. You don't need to be educated anymore about that software because it doesn't violate any of your basic human rights that that would be that would be a nice nice way to go instead of uh, putting more and more information into people's people's head i suppose i think i think you're right i think um i guess i just my concern is it's like you know what's uh, even with wasabi wallet even with say you've got like a decentralized secure social media or, you know that's perfect basically and doesn't give anything away you know what's to stop me saying you know going onto this decentralized social media saying hey my name is 
blah, blah, I have a million Bitcoin and uh, it's in a hardware wallet and I have the seed phrase on me and I'm in this place here. Here's a picture of me smiling with all my friends at this party and someone coming along and wrench attacking me and forcing me to give them the seed phrase. Like, I suppose it's like that, that people do that kind of thing uh, all the time, it seemingly. Um, and some people get killed doing this kind of thing, you know, um, rightly or wrongly, obviously it's wrong. But um, I suppose that's that's my, my concern is like, some people will never change. Some people are always going to have some sort of issue with privacy anyway. Um, but for those that are younger, I guess the, the important thing for me is like the education aspect. Like there should be some form of education, whether it's in school or whether it's just online that's easily accessible and kind of known for everyone to go to, whether it's provided by Google or whatever, um, that teaches people about how to remain private online. Because I, I think there's like, there's a lot, there's very much like, you know, my own generation uh, in, in my late 20s grew up and you didn't really know kind of, you didn't really get the importance of the like internet and what you were doing. You know, it was like back in the early 2000s, it was kind of like a playground and you just kind of experimented. And I'm sure people still think of it that way now, but you didn't really get the like, hey, if I write this status on my Facebook in 2007 or whatever, it's, it could impact me in 2021 when I'm an entirely different human being. Um, so I suppose that's just my, my concern is like making it clear to people that yeah, the internet is... A real world it's part of the real world and that like, it has clear ramifications and i suppose you need to learn to be privacy focused as well as using privacy focused software that is easy to use and is usable by you and for you but yeah i think what you're doing with wasabi wallet is a pretty awesome thing how close are you to releasing wasabi 2.0 is this like still a, a ways out or or is it coming up pretty soon mm, it should be coming up this year for sure um yeah hopefully <laughs> nice okay well I'll, I'll definitely um download it whenever the next uh, this 2.0 update comes out and give it a shot and uh yeah I'll probably switch slowly over to using it for some funds but um yeah i appreciate uh yeah appreciate your time and for you coming on it's been awesome to chat to you and kind of get some perspective and and some views on like the privacy side of things and bitcoin and, and, and lightning as well and kind of the improvements that can be made um, and yeah, please, uh, you know, keep everyone posted on, on the Wasabi wallet, uh, socials about when 2.0 is coming out. I'm sure you will let everyone know, but, um, I'll be interested to, to download it. And, uh, yeah, I just want to say thanks for your time, man. It's been, it's been awesome. And, uh, thank you to those, of, those who are listening in as well. Um, but yeah, appreciate it. Thank you guys. Um, it, it was a pleasure. I, I thought we are going to talk more about you're going to talk more about recent happenings and then I will be uh, knowledgeable of what's going on in the Bitcoin world lately. But, uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, well, I was like, we, we literally, for this, uh, we literally from last week, week to this week, we've changed like the running. Cause it, at the end of the day, like we're more interested in hearing about yourself and like what you're up to. Um, and then when it comes to the current stuff, you know, a lot of it at the moment is just Elon you know, Musk and, and like and taproot which we did ask you know, we spoke about anyway it's, it's been awesome anyway i appreciate talking to you yeah thanks guys okay.